Okay, so uh, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you your PhD doctor of, doctor of philosophy, but you were, you were not supposed to pass any exam in philosophy, which is better. No. You only have to pass the exam in physics. Well, which is a philosophy of science. Well, we, and you know Gregor perhaps very well, but now you know him after his defense, which took place in a remote mode on Friday and uh, well, what can I say? Grzegorz was, was well dressed and he uh, survived well all the questions. And now he tell us about the new project, which is uh, by far not finished. But I decided to ask him to talk about some new ideas and new things. He, uh, ah, and here we have Conrad. And I allow Conrad to bring your stuff because you may be useful. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to tell you today about, well, something about a new project that uh, we're working on, and this concerns uh, fidelity of quantum, fidelity of quantum operations. So this is the project that we've been working on with uh, Carol and with uh, the student that is under his supervision uh, in at CFT in Warsaw, and. Uh, Actually, we have started this project quite a long time ago, but today uh, this has gotten some acceleration. So let me start by defining some uh, fundamental notions that we are using. And uh, one of them is the fidelity, which for general uh, quantum states that are described by density matrices is given by the, uh, by the following formula. Uh, then, since um, this formula is uh, general, but also not very um, rather complicated in, in uh, calculations and uh, uh, in, in, in evaluation of any formulas. So at the beginning, at least, we have um, restricted ourselves to a set of uh, pure quantum states. And then the formula for fidelity uh, simplifies a lot. And uh, well, this is just the standard overlap between two uh, vectors of the Hilbert space. Now, since we are interested in uh, fidelity of channels and the operations, uh, then uh, what uh, we want to define is a quantum channel. So uh, a quantum channel is uh, something that acts uh, on, uh, uh, on a state of a system uh, through uh, Krauss operators, which are um, which are that uh, which are normalized so that uh, they preserve the trace of uh, density matrices. Now, these are all the standards standard uh, definitions. So let me maybe uh, motivate our research uh, by a simple problem. So let's say you have uh, an ideal. Uh, channel called call epsilon. Now, this epsilon might be an interesting channel uh, to implement, but uh, sometimes we are not able to implement such ideal channels in the laboratory. So what we have instead uh, are, uh, are some imperfect uh, realizations of, of this channel, let's call it epsilon tilde. And then, well, since this is imperfect, we know that uh, these two channels are not the same, but how can we measure whether uh, they are uh, a good approximation, whether this epsilon, epsilon tilde is a good approximation or not? So to do this, well, one of the ideas is just to uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry about this um, misprint. So uh, at first I was considering unitary. So in here, it should be minus uh, one, uh, uh, power of minus one. So um, yeah, but well, the idea that um, we had, well, the idea that a lot of researchers actually had in the past was that instead of considering the channel itself or, or this uh, representation, let's consider um, taking these two channels together and uh, taking the inverse of, uh, of an ideal channel. So then, if uh, these channels, uh, if this channel is a perfect approximation of, of a channel, then this should be uh, identity, because well, that's what the inverse of a channel is. But uh, then we, since we are interested in quantifying 
uh, imperfect uh, realizations, then what we do is we somehow need to qu quantify the differences between uh, this uh, identity channel and, uh, and the channel that is um, this imperfect realization. So, uh, well, in order to do that, uh, let us consider that uh, the fidelity is a good measure of that. Why? Because when you take fidelity, then if um, for, for pure states, if you take fidelity, then uh, between input and output state, uh, then if it is one, then we know that such a state was not transformed by the gate. Plus, if its fidelity for all states would be equal to one, this channel is definitely an identity. If uh, this channel is not identity, then we know that this, um, this uh, channel is, uh, well, we know that the fidelity, at least for some states, differ from one and is smaller. So, well, if we have fidelity that is given across all input and output channels, we need to somehow take, um, find some number that is going to characterize it. Because this is uh, something that is dependent on, on the input state. So what uh, a lot of people have done in the past was somehow to treat the input state as a random variable. And then if you do this, uh, you can consider that uh, what you have is a um, sampling for the from the um, space of uh, input uh, input uh, uh, states, and uh, then the fidelity that is resulting from that is gonna be uh, uh, again a random variable. So uh, what has been done almost twenty years ago uh, was uh, the connection uh, between the channel and uh, its simple action on uh, on the basis of operators and uh, the average fidelity that is average in the sense of all pure states. Um, so, well, this is uh, somehow a beginning of a story because when you have average, then what you sometimes, uh, well, this is just one of the quantifier of a, uh, of a, um, of um, probability distributions. So then what we also, uh, what was also done by other researchers, but this was like 10 years ago, was uh, the computation of variance and higher moments of fidelity. But then the problem with uh, these, um, these different measures of, uh, of the distribution of fidelity is that uh, the variance itself is quite simple to compute, but for all the um, uh, simple cases, for, for even for the simple cases, uh, higher moments are very hard to find. I mean, there is an, uh, an expression for that, but it is definitely not easy to, to find. So the goal, the motivation for our research was to find, um, to specify some important um, important properties of these probability distributions for certain channels. But they, to be fair, for the authors, could you mention the authors of the paper? Yeah, so this was uh, by Nielsen. Yes. And, and uh, this uh, I have forgotten right now, but I think these were from Oros. From, Mer from Denmark. Mer yes, I think it was him, yeah. Comparing the composition of the channel and the two identity means we are only looking at invertible channels, or is there something you can do with the non invertible channels? Um, oh, okay. So, okay, let me go back uh, to the, that slide. So, um, you are right that uh, in, in this uh, expression means that uh, the motivation at least holds only for these channels that are invertible. So this is giving us a good motivation to work with, with this. But um, I would say that this is only a motivation and the problem itself still holds.
for the channels that uh, for the channels that are even not composed in, in this way. So the motivation that is important for us to keep in the back of the head is that uh, the fidelity of channels is important for certain group of for a certain set of channels because then uh, we can answer a question of how good is the implementation. Uh, but uh, in the other way, it's still uh, interesting from the theoretical perspective to answer some general questions about uh, channels. Um, I hope this answers your question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. No, but let's go back to the next slide. So basically, this quantity um, uh, average in the energy of A, maybe you can write on the blackboard, is not defined. It is defined for this result, yes? But uh, you can define it for also not invertible channels. Yes, that, that's exactly what I said. No, no, yeah, yeah, but you said, but maybe it's good to write it down. It was not written anywhere. The, the so well, just this. Oh, bar, it is equal to sure. average uh, like psi e of psi psi psi. Sure. Most important basic uh, equation. Sure, you're right about that. Yes, so let's write capital letters first. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, are, yes, yes, yes. Are the, the yeah. Uh, yes, and now this, no, 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 okay, E acting on side side, E itself doesn't, yeah, 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 right, yeah, so that's right, side side and then side again, yes, and then this uh, important uh, definition somehow does not de depend on the fact whether E is. Uh, invertible or not. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I haven't uh, put uh, this uh, important equation in there, but uh, well, I hope. So average fidelity of an input state and output state over all possible Q states. That's yes. Uh, yes. Mm. We, we integrate over the set of all Q states. Yes, yes, but this epsilon, uh, I mean, no, that start from the channel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it like a function of these two initial channels that you want mm -hmm. to compare? Yes. So this can be thought yes. exactly. So this, okay. Oh, it's, it's of this. This can be thought yeah. as a composition of it. So in, they are rarely invertible, I guess. Yes. Well. <laughs> so Perhaps I mean. You can purify them or something like that. Well, that's one way to look at it. Okay. But uh, I'm just saying that sometimes uh, in the you may wonder what yeah. would be. Uh, the best way to quantify such um, uh, such implementation of, of these channels, but well, okay. in this case, this uh, this is simple. But I mean, still the question holds uh, without at least this kind of uh, physical motivation for for the channels that are not composed of these invertible ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one more thing. So look, uh, unfortunately, Jakub Czartowski is here with us, but he was working on the idea of the signs and t designs. Yeah. What is t design? Is a set of states such that some integral continuous average is equal to the finite average. Yes. So look, this exactly uh, plays the role of such a one design. Why? Because uj is just a okay in a sense a basis, but here yeah. it happens that if you make a sum of a finite number, in this case it is. Maybe it's good to, to know this is like go j from one to d square, yes? Yes, in this case. So you have d one. square uh, points which correspond to the basis in this Hilbert Schmidt space of operators, and you get the exact result. Yes. Ah, ah because it's linear and stuff. Right? Yes, something like this, yes. Yes, yes exactly. So, in a, way, in a sense, it's like simple applications of the notion of design. In fact, it, I think it's one design or two design. Okay, never mind. Uh, but it, it works. Yes. Mm. Well, and one design has to be simple. Yes, so one okay. design. Okay, so uh, state. This is just the basis, but here yeah. we have the operator, so maybe yes. it's already yes. two design. But in principle, any basis one. Yeah, basis. Oh, oh. No, never. Mind. Yes, okay. go yeah. ahead. No, but you. Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah. So now that we have uh, somehow motivated the problem and introduced the uh, things that we are interested in measuring and finding. Uh, let me go back to an idea that is uh, quite studied, well studied by Conrad, who is present in here. And uh, this is a numerical range of an operator. And as it turns out, uh, it is uh, very much connected with uh, 
um, with exactly the problem of determining fidelity of uh, quantum operations. So um, numerical range of an operator is uh, basically a set of all possible complex numbers that arise uh, when you uh, treat uh, the operator from both sides with, uh, with normalized quantum states. And uh, expectation value, expectation value of, uh, yes. So since this is a, a set on the a complex plane, uh, well, we can also associate um, with this um, um, with this uh, certain numbers, which would correspond to the radius of this set. So let me draw. Uh, I'm not sure which part of the blackboard is seen in here. Uh, Okay. Uh, it's not yet, but okay. You need to uh, draw very thick lines because the contact is not that. Okay, I guess. Yes. Uh, now it's better. Yes. Really. Uh, so I can ask the online audience if you can see anything. I think you could. Yeah, I can okay. see. Okay. Great. So let's say you have some undetermined uh, uh, undetermined set in here. Uh, on the complex plane, uh, then this will be the minimal radius, which was not studied uh, um, a lot in the literature. But what was studied more is the a numerical radius, which is a maximal distance from the set uh, to the to the central uh, to the center of coordinates. Now. Uh, since now uh, I want to convey a message that there is an exact correspondence between numerical range of an operator and um, and fidelity, at least for uh, the channels that are unitary. So uh, let's consider a unitary uh, unitary uh, channel that is uh, let's say given by um, by you. And then we have and then as you can see, this is basically um, So this is a squared distance. So let's say that this point corresponds to the state psi. So then the fidelity of an operation acting on, on, the, on this state psi is given by the square, absolute value square, value square of uh, the, the numerical rate. So now there is a, this uh, correspondence which is well, pretty simple. Uh, but what is maybe not trivial is that then we have some tools from the numerical range uh, field uh, that we can use to study um, fidelities. So let me put this uh, into perspective and uh, please hold this in the back of your head that the minimal distance from the set to the, uh, to the center of the uh, coordinates is uh, given by the minimal fidelity of a given unitary uh, unitary operation and the maximal is connected to a uh, to the numerical radius. Now, uh, we're in here. Uh, how can we um, find then the distribution uh, from the set, um, the distribution uh, that we are interested in of uh, this uh, fidelity? So. What we know is the average in the case of, um, of operations. But if we are also interested in this function as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a random variable, then what we want to find is the probability distribution function. As, and this can be obtained by a simple um, by a simple uh, reason, what we do 
is we define the is we find uh, how many points are on the given radius uh, are from the um, cent center of uh, of um, and is this number a shadow uh, like uh, piecewise not piecewise well or piecewise constant let's say function like this or... in in this case so actually what, what you have in here is numerical shadow but well this is numerical range yeah. but uh, what i wanted to say uh, later is uh, the numerical shadow that arises from it okay uh so first uh mm, the motivation is as follows what you have is if you find the uh numerical so let's call it that uh we have this uh, random variable w which is the numerical range of a given operator that's with and w u and then if we find the probability distribution function uh, so this this variable is just the expectation uh, this this is just uh, the expectation value of this uh, of this function squared so what you, what you want to have is find the probability distribution function of um Finding a state at distance r from origin. Exactly. Okay, but sorry, but I'm not sure the main question was stated. Basically, I think it's good to write it down. Look, you have a random state psi, and you compute this fidelity with a fixed operation e. And yes. You ask what is the probability distribution p of f. Yes. Okay, but okay. maybe you should write it or at least mention this because. I'm not sure it was mentioned. Uh, I somewhere. think it was mentioned, but I have not written it down. And yes, it would be useful to do that. Okay. So, a big question probability function of. Um... Okay. Yeah, well, um, okay, so we are uh, interested in PDF of a uh, given uh, fidelity of a given channel. And sometimes, uh, as in the case of unitary channels, of uh, if this can be. Uh, in this formulation, you don't see a random state stability given a random state, yes? Because stability is state okay. Yes, actually, in here you can do this. Given psi random. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, as you can see, the problem is very much connected, at least in, in the case of unitary channels, with the problem of numerical range. So uh, to motivate this uh, this geometrical picture that I have shown you in here, basically what we are interested in is the uh, probability uh, distribution function of uh, um, of a numerical range, but parameterized by va variable. R, the distance from the center. So in the case I have uh, shown in here the numerical range which is given by some set which is uh, somehow arbitrary, but in the case of uh, systems uh, like this unitary matrices and generally in the case of normal matrices, uh, what we have is that the numerical range is given by convex hull of uh, eigenvalues. So in the case of uh, three by three matrices, all of, the, um, all of the sets that are given by numerical range uh, are uh, spanned by uh, three eigenvalues. 
in the case of uh, four by four matrices, these are uh, quadri quadrilaterals. But uh, since what we are interested in is not only the area that we are integrating over, but also the density that is underlying uh, in this area, we may want to ask, well, uh, this is numerical range, but uh, what is the uh, probability uh, function that is underlying this? And in the case of uh, three by four, three matrices, uh, this, as it turns out, is given by the flat distribution. So this stems from the fact that, um, a, well, basically, uh, I'm pretty sure Conrad could explain this better, but basically, uh, in all of these cases, the numerical range is just the projection of a, uh, of a set that is multidimensional. And uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, three by three matrices, this is only two dimensional. So we have a projection of a triangle onto a plane. And this projection is always, uh, if the distribution on the triangle is uh, uniform, then distribution on the plane is also uniform. In the case of four by four matrices, the situation is not so simple anymore, since the simplex that is uh, created uh, in the, in this multi-dimensional uh, space is given by a tetrahedron, which does not need to be regular, but uh, then if you project that tetrahedron onto a plane, the distribution, if the distribution on a tetrahedron was um, uniform, the distribution on a plane is no longer uniform. So now, uh, as you can see, the, the problem of determining uh, this uh, distribution is only simple and the answering the question of, um, of this uh, probability given uh, this radius, uh, this distance to the center is only simple in the case of three by three matrices. However, uh, we have, uh, well, made quite an extensive uh, uh, study of this set. And uh, well, this is the main part of the pictures that I would like to show you. Uh, which are quite interesting. So what you can see on the slide is that uh, we have uh, a fidelity uh, of an operation that, are give, that is given by a single unitary Krauss operator. So exactly the case in here. This uh, unitary operator is uh, diagonal. Uh, and then um, what, we, what we can see is that the fidelity is given by a function that is continuous, but with some cusps. You see uh, some, of the, uh, some of the places at which there is some discontinuity, non, not in the function, but in the uh, first derivative of the function. So why is that? What is the, the reason behind that? And well, look, this of the A, this operator is plotted in this eigenvalues, and that's those three numbers, yes? Yes. And they are just, uh, they determine the uh, corners of the triangle. So one is one, yeah. and then uh, the angle pi half. Ah, yes, pi half is above. Yeah. Okay, so maybe it's good to find. Yes, pi half is above, and then minus uh, two over pi. Yes, is what? This yes, is pi this is one, this is pi half, and, and this, this is, is minus, uh, minus two thirds. Okay, okay. I don't understand why this. PDF is uh, like sometimes decreasing. Yes, and well, okay. no, 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 that's not always the case. But uh, I'm going to show you later also other examples. So this is only the example to uh, to to convey you the message that uh, well, sometimes by these numerical ranges you can understand something that is well that doesn't seem so simple. So mm, well. Normally, we uh, we well we are very much we are very much interested in those special points that uh, that we see the discontinuity the discontinuity in the uh, first derivative. So actually, what you can see by this, by studying the numerical ranges is that well, if you want to do if you want to basically because the the, the this PDF that is shown in here 
is basically uh, the square of uh, probability um, of a uh, numerical range given radius. So what you can do is since this is the, uh, the triangle given by numerical range, and let me remind you, this is uniform. Uh, the, the probability on this uh, triangle is uniform. So what we can do from the perspective of uh, computing how many states are actually in some radius around the center, well, we do the, basically we see how, well, we see how many radius, uh, uh, how many um, states are in a given radius. And then this corresponds to the uh, probability uh, on uh, the probability of uh, fidelity of an operation. But if it is horizontal axis of fidelity can be translated into R square, you increase the, the radius, you integrate over triangle, you're looking for the circles of a larger radius. And basically this shows you the colors, uh, how uh, likely it is to find a given radius. Exactly. So then what you see is, what you can see easily is that uh, these integrations, uh, well, they have a strict borders. And these borders occur exactly when you increase this, uh, this ball, this circle, and then when you encounter the first border. So this is exactly the point of uh, encountering the first border. So then you square of this R1 is exactly F1. Uh, and then you can really explain why you have a flat distribution in the left part. The uh, flat distribution, uh, well, it stems uh, from the fact that we have this uh, square distribution in here, but then uh, you do this square uh, in here, right? So, uh, so B of R is R B R. Yes, exactly. So B R squared. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. When when uh, from this uh, uh, we uh, we know that this is flat in this region. So then, when you increase it even more, you need to uh, you need to also. Um, well, take into account the fact that uh, right now part of the circle is no longer in our uh, in the triangle we are interested in. But then we encounter this R2, which corresponds to F2. And we have another discontinuity because from now on, we need to consider a second, uh, second part, which is outside of a circle and so on, uh, making it uh, the whole uh, making uh, the whole distribution. And uh, well, this uh, shows us that by understanding numerical ranges, we can understand at least simple cases of fidelity. In here, um, I have a similar, uh, similar um, plots that are, um, that are uh, shown for the, for the cases of other um, of other uh, operators, of other unitary operators. So as you can see, not always uh, there exists this uniform distribution at the beginning. And why is it not always? Well, this is simply because of the fact that the triangle that the triangle that is composed of eigenvalues of the unitary matrix doesn't need to include the center in, in, inside. So if it does not include the center, like in here or in here, then there will be um, a discontinuity. Uh, well, uh, then the, uh, the support of the, of the fidelity uh, will not include uh, the, um, the smallest numbers. Uh, well, so basically, um, all of these calculations that are shown in here uh, are, um, uh, are as, uh, obtained as a result of this uh, simple consideration of triangles inside circles and then integrating over. Sorry, but let me go back. Yeah, sure. But look, maybe it's good to say that here you have comparison of some histogram you can numerically. And blue lines, but you have not. I think the blue lines are in the next slide. I mean, they are defined in the next slide. But I, I've seen some equations. 
Okay, but will you present those blue lines? Because the blue lines, uh, as in the analytical results? Yes. No, because uh, these are quite, uh, well, cumbersome expressions. No. Just one line. Well, okay. No, no, so no, look, if you've got them and you plot them, it's not to show that you have them and to somehow show that you did it. No, okay. It's I, so complicated. Mm, uh, yes. So, okay. Single I'll, line, one line. Okay, you're right. So uh, actually, we have, uh, as I remember now, we have uh, these uh, calculations. Of, uh, you mentioned if you already display analytical results. Yes. It's not a secret, or you prefer it to keep it secret. Before. Yes. Well, we're not going to keep them secret, definitely. Um, so, um, well, actually, um, well, this is. Uh, uh, what I wanted to mention in here, because uh, this concerns uh, the the probability distribution of a fidelity of uh, Q3 channels. Well this, is different story now. well, this is a different story, but uh, since these mixed unitaries can also uh, concern uh, the, well, you can have mixed unitaries uh, or you can have one mixed unitary, which is unitary basically only. And then in, in, in this sense, the, the formula uh, will uh, just simplify to the latter uh, formula. Uh, I don't understand. So okay. You have different uh, unitaries of Krauss operators or something. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now you you can you can have a couple of Krauses which are mixed unitaries, okay. and then using those uh, mixed unitaries, uh, you find uh, a matrix which is com which is diagonal, and then the probability distribution is not given by a function which is simple to um, to analyze in the general, but is given by a uh, integral uh, that uh, well of uh, some numbers that uh, well we believe will, can be simplified uh, to some maybe simpler formula to maybe some uh, to some integrals that are at least cataloged, uh, catalog, uh, but uh, well. And, and, and sigma are Gelman matrices or something, or sin matrices? Or... Yeah, these are just uh, the, yes, uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, okay. Um, Where's the finder? <laughs> Mm, yes, this is uh, so. This is the, the matrix that uh, mm, is uh, given by uh, some diagonal values that are later on can be used to evaluate this this integral. Uh, sorry, but x tilde is not related to fidelity. No, no, no. Ah, well, just... in itself, uh, well, yes. it is related in in some sense, but I don't want to dwell into that. Ah, okay. But actually, it it can be used easily to uh, compute averages, uh, average of, of fidelity. But as, as itself, yes? What's the one in, in the cosine next to the Yeah, this is just uh, identity. I, I'm sorry, uh, later I, I, I used, uh, earlier I used uh, different uh, notation. Yes, sorry for that. Yes? So like comparing with those unitary channels, now this is a random uh, yeah, it can be it can be any unitary, yes. yes like comparing with a pure unitary KK and this, like, what is the difference? The, the difference uh, is that uh, in here, uh, what you have is that there could there are a couple of unitaries. So in here you have mixed unitaries. In before, what you had was only one unitary. That's fine. Because in, in these cases, uh, this, um, well, uh, I, I can say that the, this, uh, the case shown on the next slide is just a generalization of this setup. So, well, in here, what you can see is that by just using simple integration over square, uh, circles inside triangles, mm -hmm. you can uh, easily compute uh, these, um, these graphs. You can find all of these uh, 
probability distribution. Whereas uh, in there, well, it requires uh, several more calculations, but in the end, you also can obtain this analytical formula. Yes. Well, um, so at the end, well, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, the, the, the project is still in, in research. I mean, we still are not sure in which direction uh, should we proceed uh, with maybe evaluating um, some more um, some more properties of the uh, um, distributions that we are interested in, but if you, you want to, if I want to, I want to just to give you the motivation that um, the fidelity can be used easily to to measure how much a given um, a given uh, operation preserves states, and in particular how much a given operation, if it is composed of the um, of the oh. matrix. Uh, if it is composed of the operations that we are interested in evaluating and the approximation to that, then the minimal fidelity, which is given by, by the minimal distance from the center uh, to, the, um, to the numerical range, at least in the cases of these uh, unitaries, is um, given, uh, will, will give this minimal fidelity, which somehow might be interesting from the point of view of the experimentalist for um, who are um, creating such uh, approximations in, since then, um, they uh, might be interested in knowing uh, which states are these that are um, the worst in the respect of being preserved. Well, finally, this is just an additional motivation to get you interested in the work of uh, Conrad because it seems like numerical range uh, is quite an important uh, notion in the quantum information and can be used in, well, all across it. <laughs> At least that's yeah. that what he hopes so, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And you talk just three days after your defense. So let us start the discussion. Who has any questions here or uh, elsewhere? Sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's end of the presentation. Right? Yeah, sure. In this, you say you have to capture the matrix with this, like the three numbers, right? Number one, number yes. So, this is the case for the lagger in the uh, Okay. Now, like from this, like well yes in, if you if you consider so basically if you consider the, the case of only one unitary then all of these uh, pk well there is only one pk and this is equal to one uh, so when this, this expression is uh, well uh, definitely simpler and uh, then uh, we have these uh, well quite not so uh, not so complicated expressions that I could have put on the slide before, as Carol mentioned. Uh, but uh, well, th these are just the special cases of, of, of this. Yes, exactly. And this uh, NK tensor NK is like an exterior product. Like yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. So what about not unitary or not multi-unitary channel? Yes. Is so. The technical difficulty is that now, uh, if you consider more than, um, basically, oh, let me use this. So let's say, you have huge letters and huge uh, yes. uh, thick line. Yes. Well, let's say even let's. Uh, 
even for pure strings. Let's say you have two cross operators, A1, A2. When you basically obtain the same expression concerning A2 in the, uh, in the expression for the fidelity, and then what you have is basically So now the problem is that what you have are these joint numerical ranges. That's what they call it, right? Mm -hmm. So you have numerical range, which is a complex number in here and a complex number in, in here. So when you consider the sum of them, it is, well, not a Cartesian uh, sum in the sense that all of the pairs are uh, equiprobable, but you need to consider the, the dependencies between them. Maybe just a comment that for uh, for two cross operators, maybe you can simplify it because you know that a one that dagger plus a one sorry that a two dagger a two is called identity minus a one dagger a one. Uh, yes, basically the, the method that we have used to do that was that uh, we consider the, the Hermitian and our anti-Hermitian part of that, and then when you do that, it it simplifies things a lot. Uh, so you can also uh, well conduct several calculations in, in, in this case, but uh, well, I have just not had the time to put them in here. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Oliver. Yes. Yeah. So please read it. Does comparing the composition of a channel and its inverse to be identity mean we're only looking at the inter invertible channels or is there something we can do with non-invertible ones? Um, yes, actually, as I read it, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and maybe one, so let me just follow up on this one question. So you said, because there may be invertible channels in the sense that the inverse exists, but it's not a channel. Yes. So do you, can you find this statement, or does your channel really have to be invertible, like invertible? Well, no, as, as, as we were talking before, actually, this was only a, like a part of the motivation because. Mm -hmm. You can also do these things with non-invertible channels. It wouldn't matter from the perspective of a method that we are exploring. So the inverse of a channel has to be a channel. It can be exactly. That's why I want to do this. But you are doing infinitarity. Yes. Yes. We 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 also are exploring this direction. So, uh, are there further questions? So look, here is a collection of corners. There are three dimensional objects. So I was thinking, well, basically, you start discussing this issue. So, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think for what channels such object three dimensional would be useful? Well, uh, simple as possible and nice. I think one of the cross operators would have to be Hermitian. Yes, one Hermitian yeah. and second, whatever. Uh, whatever. Yeah. And then, of course, to have something interesting, we should take. Channels of size three, yes. instead of size two, and uh, it will be an ellipsoid. Yes. Uh, so, for instance, okay, we can ask uh, Conrad. So, my uh, first choice would be okay, like this. We're just about to finish, but okay, let's uh, uh, write. Uh, yes, uh, let's put it like this. Mm. Very simple. Mm. So you have two parameters A and P, okay. and now you have K2, which is equal, uh, and now it's not this is diagonal, this is non diagonal. Mm. Mm. 
and here comes which you now write uh, like this this is uh, zero square root of p this is symmetric part yeah. mm. uh, and plus i so here's one half but it doesn't play any role and here there will be another one will be like zero square root of pi uh, i yeah. i minus so like sigma y here and here again the same and uh, square root of no sorry here square root of i mm. okay so now you have basically two counter count operators if you sum them you easily see that k1 dagger k1 plus k2 dagger k2 is equal to identity but look uh, this is diagonal uh, sorry so this is Hermitian. this is not diagonal and this is not Hermitian. it's not normal so then this uh, already is it's numerical range is two-dimensional and then it's equal to the numerical range of this part and this part with letter i so here you have like sigma x and this is like sigma y. So it should, sorry, yes, yes, should be also y. Y and minus. Yes, y, y, y and minus. So now a question. So in fact, uh, Conrad, you are able to do basically for any uh, triple of okay. operator. So I was thinking yes. you can ask Conrad to think, for instance, for different. So for instance, this is already non trivial case. Come to see. This is already, you have two count operators, and they are in a sense very non unitary. Yes. Because of course, this is not normal. And I presume that for such a family of relatively large family of operations, one could possibly do something. At least Conrad can implicitly write down his program to produce such an object. And having such an object, so look, now this numerical range will be three dimensional. It will look more or less like this, possibly like this. You put it somewhere, and okay, in the space, and you look for the point at the boundary, which is as far from zero as possible. Right here, yes. So you take the object. And you look for its numerical range, so a point which is as far as possible from the uh, yes. Uh, so can it be done? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. So I hope you can somehow yes. Uh, don't know <laughs> communicate with Conrad. Okay. So you see there are a lot of uh, possibilities to improve and to go forward. Especially those three operators of size three. This is your domain, yes. Mm -hmm. And you produce nice object like this. Yes, and Conrad more or less knows for which class of uh, objects he will get for what class of operations. Yeah, I said no, that idea. I mean, yes, it looks like it could be this or just a uh, oval. Yes, an oval. Okay, what but even if you have an oval, you can basically knowing this oval, the only task is to find the closest and the most further yes. point. Wow. Well, so maybe something can be done analytically. Okay, so I think uh, it's now a good time to finish. So let me thank all of you for being with us, for uh, those who delivered talks during this semester. So I would like to thank, and then I would like to wish you a Merry Christmas and a good, healthy, uh, here. <laughs>